less stuff. Um, so that's how we're gonna run codes from now on. Okay? How's that sound? I like this thing. So we're gonna kill every patient. We're gonna kill every patient and then we're gonna walk away and pretend like it never happened. Oh, maybe he's alive. Maybe he's alive. Click on it. Okay, there's let's go back. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, a couple topics, acute coronary syndrome also known as ACS. So I know I throw a lot of abbreviations out at you guys, like uh, we're talking about Dewey's and stuff like that. So a, uh, acute coronary syndrome is commonly referred to as uh, ACS. Um, so you guys did your papers, your uh, field work, right? Yeah. So let's talk about it. Tell me what, tell me what ACS is. Everybody all at the same time, go ahead and volunteer. Awesome, keep it up. coronary <laughs> artery. Uh, the spectrum of coronary artery diseases, okay? So, what would acute coronary syndrome be? Something that happens quickly. Instantaneous, right? Mm -hmm. Acute. So we go back to our medical terminology. So acute coronary syndromes are uh, sudden onset events, right? So what would we think of uh, as an event that we respond to? That would be something like that. Chest, chest pain. Chest pain, okay. So when it comes to chest pain, are there a multitude of different causes of chest pain? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about that kind of in that history taking thing, like there's cardiac chest pain, there's pulmonic chest pain, there's muscular chest pain, there's traumatic chest pain, right? So how are we gonna make the de determination between muscle pain, coronary pain, uh, all the different types of chest pains that are out there? Related symptoms? Okay, what kind of things are going to happen in cardiac related stuff? They're going to have referred pain. Blood pressure changes. Okay. Rhythm quality changes. Cool monitor rhythm. Pale, cool diaphoretic. Can you have pale, cool diaphoretic with somebody that has a traumatic injury to their chest? Yes. Yeah. All right. So is that something that's like, yeah, we're going to help build our case, but is that going to kind of seal the deal at all? No. Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Uh, let's see, what else? History? Respiratory issues. History, like what? Like if they've had heart problems or any other medica medical history regarding the heart. Yeah, so like, hey, has this ever happened before? Have you had any problems like this before? Uh, Are you prescribed nitro? Prescribed nitro, who gets prescribed nitro? Angina. Angina. EMG basics, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Patients have a history of this kind of stuff, angina. Right, they don't just give nitro out to normal right. uh, patients uh, unless there's some sort of associated pre-existing chest pain, right? Like, that's what we give nitro for, is it, for chest pain related stuff. We don't give it for hypertension. We don't give it for uh, things that they used to. It's basically, if you have a patient that's associated with any sort of past history of chest pain, also known as angina, then they have that prescribed in their prescription stuff, okay? Um, <coughs> so this acute coronary syndrome is a, usually it's a complete blockage, okay? So these are the ones that people end up having coronary artery bypass grafts, okay? Your cabbages, your open heart surgeries, they're going to, uh, you have your vessels, your uh, coronary <coughs> arteries, your, uh, or not coronary, coronary arteries uh, that uh, basically provide blood and oxygen to the heart muscle, right? So when one of these gets blocked, it's an acute onset, happens as a daily, so what kind of things cause this blockage? Plaque. Plaque? Plaque. What's another term for plaque? Long, not a medical term. Can you guys spell that? Put that in your chart, make sure it's spelled correctly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Plaque sound, I was like that one. Plaque. plaque sounds so much better, right? It's so much easier to spell. Okay. So, plaque build up, what else? Clots. Thrombosis. thrombosis. What type? How how does a thrombosis occur in the coronary arteries a lot of the time? AFib. <coughs> okay. What else? So does does plaque just continue to build, continue to build, continue to build, and then eventually just boom, all of a sudden something happens? Breaks loose and moves from another part of the body. Okay. It can break loose completely and travel from one part of the vessel. No. Notice here. So say you got this big vessel up here. So say you have a big buildup of plaque here. Something's going on here, right? So you get this buildup, 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 
and all of a sudden, like you start to get a kind of a little bit of avulsion on the inside of the coronary artery, the plaque, it breaks off. Right? Where's it going to travel? Farther in. To the capillaries. Right? So right now it's not blocking anything up here. It's just narrowing. And so a lot of times people will develop chest pain that goes away. Right? So with an increase in oxygen, oxygen demand, as that oxygen demand goes up, they get the chest pain. As they relax, their heart rate doesn't need all the oxygen. Boom. So you're getting some blood down there. But as soon as this thing breaks off, travels down to these smaller portions, these smaller vessels, what's it going to do? Block. Cute. It's going to block the whole thing off, right? And so what's that going to start to cause? Does this part of the heart need blood the same like this part of the heart? Yes. yes. What's the big pumper for the heart? Left ventricle. Left ventricle, right? So we're down here, and you notice how at the bottom of the ventricles, take a look at how small these vessels get, right? So it would be nice if you just took all these vessels and put them upside down and put all the big vessels down here on the bottom and made the smaller ones up here because the top isn't quite as important, right? But it's not like that. So you're going to get these smaller vessels down here, so it's a lot easier to cause damage and to get that occlusion uh, in an acute uh, fashion. Okay. Uh, so with these blockages, is it something that it could be completely permanent, where boom, the, the blockage is in there and it's stopped? There's nothing, and we're going to say uh, there's no hospital setting yet. Like, can can those plaque? chunks, those thrombosis, can those things float around? Can they become lodged for a while and then loosen up and get yeah. somewhere else? Mm -hmm. What kind of things cause those things to move? Vasodilation. Vasodilation. Cool. So what kind of medications do we use for vasodilation? Nitro. nitro. Okay. Morphine. So why do you think people are prescribed nitro then? Because if they feel chest pain, the doctor's like, oh, you or something. So you have some sort of reason. They've gone in, more than likely, they've done some sort of angiogram, angioplasties. They've gone in and looked, and they found some sort of coronary artery blockage or narrowing by injecting dye into the, uh, the, either the femoral artery or a subclavian area. Uh, so they've <coughs> injected dye, and they've gone through, and they've looked, and they've watched uh, blockages. Um, there, do they get to do special procedures? Uh, or help right get them into a cap? All right, so that's a cool thing. That was one of the coolest uh, right, or internship spots. So we used to do an OML time. We did eight hours at OML, uh, drawing labs and stuff. And then somebody in my paramedic class got stuck with a dirty needle. They immediately pulled the rest of the class out, sent everybody into the cath lab instead. The cath lab was super cool because what did they do all day? Inject dye and you get to watch the heart and they get to go in and put balloons and stents in there. And you actually get to see instant reperfusion of the heart. So when you guys are in your ER rotations, and a medic unit brings in a cath alert, try and be involved with going upstairs with them. Okay? Be like, hey, can I, can I go? Nine, nine out of 10 times, the ER staff's gonna be like, yeah, absolutely, go with them. Uh, okay? I mean, when do you guys start your ER stuff? This week, Friday. Perfect. Start mine Monday. So they'll, they'll do, so when you guys are in the ER, they'll do alerts and they'll do the cath alerts, the stroke alerts, and stuff like that. You wanna try and get as, as involved with that pre hospital alert portion of it so that you're following that patient. You see what happens from the time they hit the door to the time they make it to the room. Every cardiologist I've ever worked with, they're like, yeah, sure, come on. <laughs> it's totally awesome. They're really, really cool. They're happy to have you there and show you and teach you. Absolutely. Uh, and the cool thing is, is like, when you get up there, there will be times where people will code on the table up there. And do you think they have a full allotment of resources in the cath lab at the exact time that somebody codes usually? No. So what do you get to do? Yeah. You get to get involved, right? And so that's what you, that's the one thing. When you guys start your, in, or your clinical stuff, you guys can basically be as involved as you want to be. You're going to stand off and not like be like, just kind of be like, hey, okay, yeah, I'm here. I'm putting in my eight hours. I'm going to go sit in the break room, study, and then I'm going home kind of thing. Or be like, hey, what can I do? What can I do? Like, when I, when I bring somebody in uh, and I see one of the students and they're not doing something, how do you think I respond to them? Mm. You think I'm pleasant? Just a stick. <laughs> <laughs> right? I do the, I'm like, so, what have you guys seen today? What are you doing? What are you doing right now? How come you didn't just follow us into the room? It's like you hear the radio coming, you hear we're coming in code three. Those are the ones you jump on top of. You don't need to follow in the uh, walk-in patient from the front or something like that. It's like, 
We're in the pre-hospital setting, so you guys want to see as many of those ambulances that come through the door, see the pass off that they give. Some of those are really bad. Um, see what happens as the transition. As soon as the medics walk out of the room, hear what the nurses have to say about how bad they did or how good they did. Like, oh, you know, sweet, they got IVs, or how did they miss the IVs, right? Talk to you guys about the IV stuff. You'll have bad days and you'll have good days. Like, there'll be days you can't hit the broad side of a barn, and there'll be other days you'll be like, I didn't even see a vein and I stuck the needle in there, and wow, that was the best idea I've ever done, right? Uh, and so those are just the things, like you want to be as involved in that pre-hospital setting so you can be prepared when you guys are in that role of, boom, all right, I've been there, I've seen this, got some experience on what's, what happens uh, as they, that transition hap uh, occurs from patient to, to hospital, okay? So, huh, what else do we know about <coughs> acute coronary syndrome? Didn't you guys all do a whole bunch of paperwork? <laughs> you have unstable, unstable. Progressive. Progressive, okay, who else you got? Signs and symptoms of, acute, of an acute coronary syndrome. Chest pain. Crushing chest pain. Huh, well, that's a red flag for me for cardiac related stuff. Radiation. Radiation. Commonly to which locations? Jaw, shoulder, shoulder left arm. Okay. Back up. I love how like there's like six or seven of you in the class that are ready to hit your uh, clinical stuff. You guys have some answers for me, and then there's some people like uh, I'm really not hearing a lot from you. All right, we gotta get we gotta get more involved. I want to hear from everybody. Okay, uh, we're going through this stuff. Uh, so if I'm going too fast, if I'm going too slow, if I'm all over the place, just let me know. Um, just, uh, I don't wanna have to start calling on people um, because I really hated that as a student being called on when I was like really uncomfortable and like, no, please don't call me, please, please don't call on me. Um, <coughs> and I don't wanna have to sit there and go like this and stare at you and make eye contact. When we make eye contact, that's bad, okay? <laughs> All right, so signs and symptoms, acute coronary syndrome. Labored breathing. Labored breathing, okay. How would they present with this labored breathing? What would you expect to see? Shortness of breath, but able Tripod to. Tripod position. Shortness of breath, but able to take a full breath. Yes, okay, good, because that's gonna tell you what? That not it's not a pulmonary issue, it's a cardiac issue where the blood's not getting to the lungs to perfuse the blood so that they're, they're uh, gasping for, or having a difficult time catching their breath. Okay, so some of your oxygen exchange is diminished based on your heart not being able to pump the blood all the way through, right? It's not getting good circulation, right? No. So what, what do you think your distal circulation potentially could be? Uh, or, 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 or weak, good. thready. Good, so potential for a lower blood pressure, right? What would you expect your heart rate to initially do? Uh, increase. 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 Okay, so initially it's going to increase, right? Yes. Do we want an increased heart rate no. with increased oxygen demand on the heart? No. no. Do we want the heart to work harder? No. no. Okay, so these are these are these are signs that we're just like, okay, we've got to figure out what's going on. And so uh, has Corey talked about like the three causes of hypotension? No. 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 All right. So you have a pump problem. Oh yeah. Great problem. Oh, I hear it, yeah? No, keep going. No, 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 no. Go ahead, Justin. I hear it again. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm just, it's, it's recalling my brain. I was just saying volume problem as well. Okay, yeah, volume problem, fluid problem. Rate. Rate, fluid, and container, container problem. Container, yeah. Okay? So those are the three things. So of those three things, if you have a rate problem, fluid problem, and a container problem, of those three things, what things can we fix? What do we want to fix first, usually? Container. Um, finding out why it's Container. Happening. Okay? Yeah, so container. the first thing that you're going to want to do is you want to fix the rate problem. Okay? Because usually if you fix a rate problem, the fluid problem is because unless they're actively losing fluid, like unless you see them losing fluid out, the rate is what's, what the, is the primary cause for it. Okay? So what would you expect if somebody had low volume, okay, so say they were down a couple quarts, what would you expect their heart rate to be? Increased. Elevated, right? 
But would you expect it to be elevated to the point where the rate became an issue? Or would you expect it to be attempting to compensate and then your blood pressure kind of drops? Like, will your heart rate jump to 220 in a, in a hypovolemic state? Or will you jump up to 130, 140, 150, and then your body's like, nope, this isn't working, and then you start to just slow everything back down, right? So now you're not compensating, right? Whereas, if you have a rate issue, the rate is gonna to continue to jump, and it's gonna to continue to go up, which is cardiac related, and so we fix the rate problem, we slow the rate down, and then we end up bringing our fluid problem back without even having to address that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so. Wait, I have a question. Yeah. So you said you would bring your fluid problem back. Uh, you, uh, sorry. you bring your rate down, but you said a minute ago that you're down a couple of quarts. I'm thinking of low blood pressure because you don't have enough fluid in, in the system. So if you Good. Your so rate down, let me clarify. So okay. I gave you two. Two scenarios there, two separate ones. Okay. So you have the low fluid issue, come course down. Yes, that is the person you fix the fluid volume. Okay. okay. You have the rate problem. This is where it goes up and it continues to go up. It doesn't go up and then head back down. So if you hit that, you'll start to hit arrhythmias, such as your SVT, your VTAX. Those are rate related hypotension causes. Okay, so you're not getting full contractions of the heart, you're not getting good circulation. If you're low on fluids, you're gonna jump up to 120, 130, turn into sinus tack, you don't have an arrhythmia. There's nothing you can do to fix that, right? Like we're not gonna give medications for, for an a increased heart rate that low, right? So this is where we top off the tank. By topping off the tank, boom, okay, now the heart rate's gonna come back down. As that opposed to the other where your blood pressure is or your volume is fine. Correct. Your body is trying to compensate with a high heart rate of 20. Exactly. Which is causing other problems. So you knock down the heart rate, which simplifies everything else. Exactly. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is this where we're talking like vagal maneuvers and uh, denosine? Exactly. Cardio so rate problems. Cardio so rate, rate problems are corrected with two things. We can either give drugs. Things. Give drugs, vagal maneuvers, so vagal stimulation, or electricity. Okay, so we fix it three different ways. All right, with fluid problems, we fix it one way. More fluid. fluid. By giving fluids. Right. So, so the big the ability to be able to recognize and make that determination of is this a rate problem, a fluid problem, or the container problem, is just part of your uh, assessment history taking, like if somebody's low on some fluids, they probably have something, they've been nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, they're uh, hypovolemic based on some sort of blood, or not blood, fluid volume, loss, something like that. Derek, did you have a question? Never mind, just correct. Okay, good. Yes. No question is a stupid question, Derek. Well, I was gonna say there's two ways to fix a fluid problem, but the other is not a fluid problem, it's a pump pump. Right. So. <coughs> And so, did you get it? You hear the pump problem issue? So, the pump problem is the container issue, is what we're talking about. So, um, so that is which eventually we'll get into, which is the fix of dopamine. And so, we're not, we're not going to hit that. When you're talking about container problem, are you talking about dilation of the vessels? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Like your, your heart is not doing what it needs to do. This is where your heart failure starts to kick in. So, then you got to use dopamine to squeeze everything down, shunt some of the body. Um, really, really bad on the body. It's hard on the body. Um, so we'll probably hit that towards the end. Okay, what other kinds of signs and symptoms? Acute, coronary syndrome. Exertional pain. Exertional pain. It, it, or it, it improves with, or it doesn't improve with rest, but it comes on with onset with exertion. And the so onset with exertion does not, not improve with rest. Sometimes it's okay. Okay. So you have stable versus unstable when it comes to your stage. chest pains, right? Angina, stable versus unstable. So, <coughs> so unstable is nothing, nothing fixes it, right? This is where we have to perform some sort of uh, interaction to help uh, because there's probably a full occlusion. There's nothing that we can do. Uh, the, heart's, the 
person's individual body has done everything that it can to attempt to reoxygenate, but the, there's just the blockages there. So then you have to end up doing something, giving medication, uh, perform a procedure in the hospital in order to get that reperfusion happening again. So your stable, stable angina is something where there's not necessarily a full occlusion, but you're doing exercise, right? Exer exerting yourself. You have narrowing of those vessels back here. Narrowing of these vessels, but they're not occluded yet. But you narrow that down because you have plaque buildup, and it's going to decrease the blood flow to portions of the heart. So when you slow down and take a break, what's going to happen to your heart? It's going to reperfuse. What's going to happen with your heart rate? It's going to drop. It's, gonna it's, gonna it's drop not going to need as much Because why? Because you're not exerting less yourself. Demand. Less demand. So you don't have to have all that oxygen and blood flow, right? So a lot of times the, the pressure will go away. So a lot of people that are prescribed nitroglycerin are given it because they have stable angina. So normally what they should do is do exactly what you guys as EMT basics are allowed to do. A normal person should do what before we get there with their nitro? Take, take, it there. take one. How many should they take before we get there? Three. Right, so they are told by their doctor, take one, wait five minutes. Take another, wait five minutes. Take another, wait five minutes. After the third one, if you still have chest pain, Call 911. That's the directions that patients are given. Right? It, uh, a lot of times on the prescription it says take three over 10 minutes as needed. So what do people do during that 10 minutes? What, how do they normally freak out? Take they take all three at the same time, right? And then they're like, you get there and they're like white as a sheet. And they're like, I can't sit up, I can't do anything. It's like, what do they just do to their container? This <laughs> one. Yeah. Yeah. Boom. Right? So. So they have vasodilated significantly, okay? So with that nitro, <coughs> with that stable angina, we're just working on opening up those blood vessels just a little bit, okay? Trying to increase that blood flow. Get a little bit more, there's not a full occlusion. Let's say there is a full occlusion, right? So you get a full occlusion down here and you dilate these out. What can happen? It goes farther down. It just moves down. Right. It, you run the, the possibility of, hey, so say it's right here, all of a sudden, boom, it clears uh, this bifurcation here, and boom, okay, so now this is now back perfusing over here, right? I mean, theoretically, so, that'd be better, though, than it staying where it is, because it's at least you're Do you think they would give us nitro if it couldn't get things better, if we could make things worse? Yeah. No, they take everything away that has any potential of us screwing things up, they take it away from us. So, yeah, I mean, any extra oxygen that you can get to any part of the heart, any, any chance we can improve perfusion, they're going to they're gonna let us do it. Okay? Yeah? Isn't there a whole, like, don't give nitro if you suspect an inferior MI thing? Oh, the whole right-sided heart attack thing, there is absolutely. Because what does that do? I mean, you're going to bring it up, you might as well teach us all about it. <laughs> I mean, you're gonna start throwing stuff, crazy stuff out at us. <laughs> well, that nitro is gonna dilate your blood vessels, right? So if there's an inferior occlusion, um, I don't know. If you're getting to the point where you're gonna cause more ischemia to the ventricles. No, not necessarily. Are you putting Are you more? So if you dilate, you're gonna put more blood into the. All right. So I'm gonna let you guys just chew on that in your mind a little bit, and we'll hit that a little, a little bit later. Okay. So before you give a nitroglycerin, though, what's your point for up? Before you give a nitro, what are you going to want to do? Probably, yeah, probably. And get an IV. Just in case. So that whole IV thing before nitro. Um, you're going to get told a multitude of things from a multitude of different paramedics based on uh, their comfort level, their skill level. How many people, you guys are now paramedics, Paramedics, all of you. How many people want to do an IV before they get a nitro? We got one. We got two. We got two, four, five, six. Possible. Six. Uh, Derek, would you like an IV before you get a nitro? Definitely. My blood pressure. You know what? If, if, if you're considering giving nitro, then your blood pressure has to be at least what? 90. Above 90. So you got at least a 90. So now so what do you do? 90, 90, 90, 90. Let's listen to the veteran paramedic now. Make a decision. 90 complaining in chest pain, I'm not going to do it. Well, I mean, could somebody with a non-inferior MI have a 90, a solid? Sure. 
Okay, so how high would the pressure have to be in order for, for you to feel comfortable? 120s, 130s. 120s, 130s, you get without an IV? Yeah. What do you guys think? You know he's not a very good paramedic, right? <laughs> I'm waiting on the answer. I'm trying to figure out what you guys want to do. You guys are ordained paramedics now. <laughs> well, has, our, has our patient taken their three doses of nitro already? They, they, you know what? No, they didn't even know what to do. Okay. Yeah. Well, my thinking right now is it has a possibility Blake, Blake of, is engaging. <laughs> Thank you, Blake. Is, so it has a possibility of dropping the pressure. So I want the IV just in case it really dumps it. So I could have fluid. Ready. Because what, 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 is, what does the nitro do again? Uh, why would it dump the pressure? Because it increases the diameter of the vessels. Alright, so it makes your container a whole lot bigger with a whole lot. Yes. A lot of that. Yeah. Basal constriction is gone. Right? Yeah. What's that? I said same amount of liquid, just a bigger container. Right. Alright, so you open everything up. Okay? Is that going to help us get an IV if their vessels dilate and we put the constriction band on their arm? Then. They'll have big juicy veins, and the tourniquet will help to or, fill those vessels. Or because you open Blood up those pressure. vessels, the person feels the right like they're the hypovolemic now. The, but the body thinks that it's it's lost its fluid. So what does it try and do? Shoot! It tries to make that container smaller, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to try and bring all the blood here, which is going to do what to all of these veins? Cross so close it down. down. Right. So the vagal dilation is a great concept if it worked across the entire body. Okay. But the vasodilation is more associated with basically from here to here, and out here, it's gonna actually collapse your veins. It's not, it's not going to vasoconstrict or anything like that. It's still gonna vasodilate, but it's gonna dump all your blood and it's gonna try and get all your blood back to your heart, okay? So it has the potential for dumping your um, peripheral veins. Okay, so oh, another, another little complication there of nitro, right? Yes? I changed my answer. I oh, get... oh, we're back. We're back. I like it. Good. I, I want to get the IV before I do it because you should always prepare for the worst possible scenario. And then if that person, yes. if that person needs medications afterwards, we have intravenous action. Okay. What happens if getting an IV is going to be delayed? It's not. I have seen your guys' IV skills. I had a senior chamber that did that to me. Two. Yes. If it's truly delayed, like say we really suck. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the blood pressure is around 130, 140, this guy's like, oh my it's like mm -hmm. really hurts. I can get it. And then we're fine. Especially if they have a pressure. Um, Wait, I'm, not I don't think... I'm not going to delay giving nitro because I can't get an IV right away. If they have to give up. But you can ask for Why don't it? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Take an aspirin. Sorry, I'm not treating it. <laughs> so we're just talking about nitro for now. Aspirin will come along in a few minutes. Because nitro is not the only thing you do here, right? What's that? Aspirin might dictate my giving the nitro. Well, affect how, how it won't affect your... I would, guess, I, would guess, I would guess aspirin would have no effect on the chest pain that you would actually notice anything by the time that it's absorbed into the system and actually takes effect. Nitro is going to be... Nitro is one of the drugs that's given it's 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 a, a minute or two and things it's either working or it's not kind of thing and so that's why they give you that five minute buffer of hey wait five minutes do this wait five minutes do this wait five minutes do this because it works so fast and if you wait five minutes and check that pressure because it's probably going to take you about that long to check another blood pressure reassess the patient check the, the EKG and stuff then you're going to be like okay our five minutes is up okay yep did it work did it help okay what's our, what's our pain now okay no okay yep we got to give another. Uh, yes. well, this is more of a question, Paul. Does it ever, how, what, how many nitros do you have to give to your vessels? Just like, this is, why is there getting? So we stop at we stop at three. Even at the paramedic level, yeah. we stop at three. All right, that's this kind of more EMT three, basic, right? paramedic, <laughs> doctors, everybody, everybody basically just st stops at three. There may be times where they put people on nitro drips, mm -hmm. uh, in related to their condition, uh, but for the most part, the sublingual stuff, the nitro paste. Um, even for, for every level, there's this, it's just, it's just not working. So when it's not working, you've exhausted this. Move on to this. You got to move on to the next approach. Right. And is that three of theirs, and then we can do three of ours? Because 
<coughs> we don't trust the patient to tell us the truth. So, so that's where uh, being able to do your little investigation portion, how old is it, how do they use it, do they use it properly, um, and so I would always, yeah, is it stored properly, is it still floating, did you feel tingling, did you get a headache from it? So I'm gonna ask all those kinds of questions, and if they're like, you know what, I didn't, it wasn't tingling, and da da da, da it's a year old, I'll be like, you know what, I'm gonna start over with my own. Am I gonna be more cautious as I give it now, though? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm gonna be like, okay, they've already got these vasodilators potentially in their system, but now I'm gonna bring my own in, and now I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna do the first one and be like, all right, let's see what happens. I'm gonna take my initial picture, right, of my vital signs, so I have all my vitals, supposedly after they've given theirs. So I'm like, okay, if I have a blood pressure of 100 over PALP, and they took multiple pull of their own nitro, and be like, mm, this is one of those cases, I am absolutely starting an IV before I do anything for this person. Because I'm, I'm one of those paramedics that I'll absolutely give nitro before I start an IV. Because it's like, I want to get that started, I want to try and get perfusion going again, I want that oxygen going back to the heart. But, like I told you guys, you want the whole picture before you do anything. Full investigation. So, so you have a patient that is, you're on that borderline whether or not you can give nitro because blood pressure is low, but at the same time, if the body has something on board that's going to help it, the body's also going to try and help itself. So even though you are dilating your vessels by giving nitro, blood pressure goes down, the body is still going to try and shunt the extremities to help hold that uh, volume close to the core. So you're still giving the heart a, a hand to help itself, even by giving nitro, even though the blood pressure drops. Yeah, oh yeah. So it's, it's the body is still going to try and compensate with nitro on board by shunting. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. And, that, and, that is, and that's why you want to try, if you can, if you have the time and everything, you want to try and get that IV beforehand because it is going to happen. They, you, your veins are gonna go from good to not so good. And so the reason that I will potentially do the nitro beforehand is because I feel so confident in my ability to be able to get IVs that I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm still gonna be able to get an IV on this person even if I do crash all their veins and stuff just because of the years of experience, and I was like, okay, yep, I know I can get IVs on people. Uh, whereas if it's like something where they're like, yeah, I'm a really tough stick, I'll be like, Ooh. okay, I'm gonna slow play that, right? So now I'm just like, I'm gonna back up a little bit and be like, okay, you're a tough stick, you take some nitro already. I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna get my IV before I make that decision. And that's part of that big picture before you do that first treatment. Yeah. I can't stress that enough with you guys on getting the whole story before you go into something. Something that happens all the time. You walk in, somebody's like, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And the paramedic will be like, hey, when are you starting doing that on this person? It's like, is it because they are telling you they can't breathe and they sound like they're wheezing that that's why you're doing it? Or is it because they're hyperventilating because they have high anxiety that you're doing this? Because you don't know what else to do because you've got respiratory. And it's that kind of thing. It's like, take a second. Don't just automatically just start throwing out treatments. Figure out what's going on. Get, be that investigation portion, history taking, and then make that determination of, of what route you're gonna go. Uh, when you're talking about the big picture with your vitals, do you wanna get a 12 lead as well Absolutely. on those vitals? Always before. do a 12 lead before you, now that you guys are paramedics, before you give nitro, 12 lead before. Every time. Every single time, because what'll happen? Before nitro or any treatment, any mm -hmm. oxygen. Even right. oxygen can come straight down and stem yep. you and hide it from you. Yes. You do not want to have somebody that looks like crap and you start treatment because of the, hey, you're feeling cool diaphoretic, let's get some oxygen on you and start start doing stuff. And then you hook up to 12 and you're like, well, everything looks good. Oh, hey, I gave him nitro because he had chest pain. Oh, we didn't get a 12 lead. It's like, ah, geez. I've had patients that like, I get a 12 lead and I'm just like, oh, we have a STEMI here. I was like, STEMI is an ST elevation MI. Which, I don't, you guys haven't hit that ST stuff yet, have you? Yeah, we, it was a field guide. Very, field guide, very but you guys haven't discussed? No, no, no. Okay. So, EKG finding, ST elevation, shows MI, okay? Myocardial infarction. So you have that, and then you give nitro, and boom, gone. You already call it cath alert, though. You're like, yeah, coming in with a, a STEMI. And they're like, you show up and you hand them this new 12, and you're like, hey, uh, psych, uh, not really an elevation anymore. And you'll get a cardiologist that'll question you. 
And then that's when you just bring, bring it. And you're just like, oh yeah? Boom, here's my first one. Check this out. <laughs> what are they going to do with that person? They're going to take them upstairs, right? If you give them just that first one, do you think they're taking them upstairs? Mm -hmm. No. They're going to do their own 12 leads. They're going to do a bunch of tests. They're going to get a troponin level. They're going to do a bunch of stuff without going upstairs. So that's why it's really, really important to take that 12 lead and then take multiple 12 leads throughout after every single treatment. There will be times where you'll have somebody and you'll be like, man, this person looks like they are having the big one. 12 lead looks great. And you're just like, man. It's like you've just seen it enough, you, you're like, pale, cool, diaphoretic, crushing chest pain, 12 lead looks great. It's like, how many 12 leads between West Eugene and River Bend do you think I'll do? With somebody that presents like that, 10 out of 10, crushing chest pain, into my left arm, into my jaw, but the 12 lead looks great. Five, 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 five. Yeah, West like every, almost every minute on the minute, I'm just like, I'm like, this guy looks bad, click. I'll, I'll do something. I'll come back, I'll read it, and I'll look at it, because I never look at what the computer says. I always look at it first. I'm like, okay, and then I'll look at what the interpretation is. I'm like, okay, we're all on the same page. Me and the electronics, we're good here. I'm like, still looks great. I'm just like, okay, let me do this. Let me give you another nitro. Okay, print. <laughs> let me do something else. Come back, oh, same thing. It's like, it's like, dude, something is up. Like, and so there's been a time, like, when I was on probation, I actually responded on my captain's best friend. He was there on the call with me. And he's like, hey, he goes, this, this guy looks bad, blah, da, 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 da. I'm just like, yeah, this guy looks sick. So I did, uh, we were in West Eugene, and I want to say I did four. On the fourth 12 lead that I, that I got, he presented with a ST elevation. Turned, he ended up turning into a catheter, came by the station later, big hugs all around, cookies, all the, all the fun stuff. But the captain was like, hey, how did you, what made you do that? I'm like, the presentation, the way he looked, Hale, cool, diaphoretic, substernal. I'm like, he's a textbook, but just because it hasn't shown yet, doesn't mean that it's not, we're not close, right? We have a partial obstruction. We have something happening. Some, it just hasn't gotten to that point where the heart has started to die. So, he has the occlusion in the vessel, right? So he has the occlusion, so heart doesn't immediately start, or muscle doesn't immediately start dying, right? Because there's, yeah, four minutes before your brain did dies, right? So you have a little bit of time. So the more oxygen we try and do, the more nitro we try and do, we're trying to help improve this. And so eventually what happens is finally it starts to show tissue death, right? So as you get that tissue death, boom, here goes your ST elevation stuff starts happening. And then I'm like, oh, yes. I mean, Shit, not, you're dying. not for them, but for me. And I was like, oh, like, yes. And I was like, I knew it. It's like, I felt confident based on his presentation. I was just like, dude, you are having a big one, but you're not showing it yet. So they, we caught it early, boom, went to cath lab, no lasting effects, no, no heart damage at all. It was awesome. Um, so then, obviously, my DOR was amazing from my captain. He was just like, yeah, you did awesome, blah, 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 blah. I was, I was just like, yeah. So, yeah. So, so were you looking at uh, angiotic source first, and then, then you actually start going into an MI? Yes. Yeah, so you present with, just present with the chest pain, right? Chest pain, short spread. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, not, not diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, uh, pale, cool skin, um, radiating pain, jaw pain. Um, and most of the people are like that. They look like that. They're pale, very, very pale, very ashen in color. And you're just like, that's not normal for people, most people. Right? I mean, yes, some people have um, lack of uh, sun and stuff like that, but I. But, but to have somebody that's pale and diaphoretic and, and they just present differently when they're sick, okay? <coughs> and so you just continue to run through your protocol of what we can do for it. <coughs> Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. Am I losing anybody? No. A single soul. Okay. You lose me about 30 seconds to go pee, so. You guys want a break? Go to the bathroom? Do it. Go. <laughs> Just kidding.